Well, please join me in opening a copy of God's Word to the book of James. We are continuing our series in the book of James in chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. And as a reminder, what we do every Sunday here is we take a portion of God's Word and we seek as best as we can to hear what He is saying here so that we might be transformed to live differently in light of it. So let's ask for His help for this. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that it is true, the truest Word, the only true Word, through and through. We pray that You would take this now and plant it deep in our hearts and transform us so that we would not just be hearers of Your Word, but doers. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, James chapter 1, the last two verses of the chapter, verses 26 and 27, is the text we've come to in our series now. Let's read this together. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Here's the question this morning. Is Christianity good for the world? The new atheists like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens asked this question 20 years ago. They were convinced, as Christopher Hitchens put it, that religion poisons everything. Something is shifting now. Even Richard Dawkins is changing his perspective. I don't know if you're aware of this. He recently called himself a cultural Christian. He doesn't believe in Jesus. He doesn't believe a word of it's true. But he now thinks that Christianity is good for the world. He doesn't want a world that lives out consistently the moral logic of naturalism or even a different religion. He sees other religions growing in Europe, and it scares him. Many well-known thought leaders have a new openness to the goodness of Christianity, even if they're not yet open to the truthfulness of it. And many former atheists and secular, secularists are actually becoming real Christians, convinced that it is true and good and beautiful. An interviewer named Justin Brierley refers to what is happening as the surprising rebirth of belief in God. Many well-known thought leaders are coming together and sharing their stories of how they have come to see the goodness of Christianity and, in many cases, the truthfulness. They're changing how they view history and culture, actually. So the previous narrative was that Christianity and religion were regressive. But then with the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, reason triumphed over religion. Facts triumphed over faith. But many now see that this actually isn't historically true. The Christian worldview is actually what led to progress. Sharon James explains this in her book, How Christianity Transforms the World. She shows that nothing has done more in the world than Christianity for justice, sanctity of life, the dignity of women, care for the poor, education, health care, the eradication of the global slave trade, Christianity has been good for the world. And this is a feature of real Christianity, not a bug. Real Christianity isn't just true. It's good. That's the point of our text this morning in James. What does true Christianity look like? How do you know if you are a real Christian? Here's the message of James 1, 26 and 27. Your Christianity is demonstrated not just in what you think is true, but in how you speak and live. Real Christianity changes how we talk, it changes who we care about, it changes how we live in our culture. Now, I want to be clear. 
The gospel, the good news at the heart of Christianity is not about what we do, but what God has done for us in Jesus. But when we receive his forgiveness and grace, entering the Christian life, it changes how we live. And if it hasn't changed us, then we have not truly received it. Your faith must be demonstrated in how you speak and live. Otherwise, James says, your religion is worthless. So I want to show you this from these two verses. So two verses, two points. How to know if your religion is worthless and how to know if your religion is real. So first, how to know if your religion is worthless. This is the point of verse 26. Look at this again with me. If anyone thinks his religion, he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Now, when James uses the word religion here, he's using it in a broad and a neutral way. He's using it to refer to someone's experience of Christianity. Now, modern evangelical Christians don't usually use the word like this anymore. We often use it negatively as a contrast to real Christianity. So we sometimes talk about religion versus the gospel, or sometimes Christians say it isn't a religion, it's a relationship, and that's fine. There's some uh, helpful explanatory power in that and giving people clarity about what real Christianity is, but that's not always how the word has been used. Until recently, it was a neutral word that referred to all sorts of spiritual experiences, and Christians used it to refer to our own beliefs and practices. So Jonathan Edwards, for instance, in the 1700s, wrote a book titled Religious Affections. Now, that title may be kind of unappealing to us today, but it's an excellent book, and just what he means by that title is the desires and affections of authentic Christianity, how you know if you're a real Christian. James is using the word religion here to refer to real Christianity, or just Christianity in general and religion. His concern is with self-deception. Notice that he says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, some people are self-deceived into thinking they're real Christians when they aren't. He's saying, Two Christians, professing believers, some of you may think that you are religious. You may think that you are a Christian, but your heart is deceived. You say you follow Jesus, but your religion is actually worthless. There's a real danger here. You can profess faith in Jesus. You can come to church on Sunday. You can be taking notes right now and yet be self-deceived. You think you're a Christian, your religion is worthless. That's what James is saying here. Jesus warned about this in Matthew 7. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So there are people who say, Jesus is Lord. And Jesus says, they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But he says, the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So how can we know if we are self-deceived? How can we know if our religion is worthless? James gives a simple test. He says, if you don't bridle your tongue, your religion is worthless. This is the test. It's how you use your words. The test is whether or not you have control over your speech. A bit and bridle were used to control where a horse goes. So the image here is of putting reins on your mouth. You control your mouth like a rider controls a horse. So why is this the test? Well, I think James learned this from Jesus. Jesus said, whatever, whatever comes out of you and out of your mouth reveals what's in your heart. James is saying, do you want to know if you've actually been transformed by Jesus? Do you want to know if the Holy Spirit is actually in you? Do you want to know if you've experienced what Jesus refers to as the new birth, being born again? Well, here's how you can tell. Look at your words. 
the words of the test. James will expand on this in chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 2, he says that if you control your speech, you control your whole body. He says, if anyone, do, or if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. So controlling your speech is evidence that you're able to control the rest of your life. It means you have self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit. Maybe you've heard about uh, Van Halen's M&M test. You familiar with this? They would book a venue, and their contract had a lot of important technical details about stage setup and lighting and so forth. And in the midst of that contract, they added that they wanted a bowl of M&Ms with absolutely no brown ones. And for a while, people thought, what, what an example of people who are completely out of touch with reality and entitled, right? But then later, David Lee Roth said that the purpose was to ensure that the venue had read every line of the contract. They were tired of technical errors during setup. So this was to see if the venue took details seriously. If they showed up and they looked at that bowl of M&Ms, and they saw brown M&Ms, they would have to check everything because they knew that this place doesn't take details seriously, and then they would find errors. And some of these errors could torpedo the whole show. This is also like the employment test my dad used to use. Uh, my dad was a brilliant manager in retail management, and he had a test in his hiring process. So after the interview, he would just walk the interviewee out to the car to say goodbye so that he could glance in the car. And if the car was absolutely trashed, that would tell him, right, no matter what this person looks like right now, they don't know how to manage life well, or there's at least a risk, right, that they're not going to do this well. He went out there one time and saw some empty beer bottles in the car. Not a good look. Guy probably didn't get hired. James is saying, I need one test to see if you're a real Christian. Let me listen to your words. If your words are changing, you are changing. You may go to church. You may read theology books. You may have a great family. You may not have scandalous sins in your life. But James is saying, I only need to see how you talk to your spouse when no one's around. I just need to see how you speak to your kids. I just need to pull up your social media and text threads and see what you're really like. What do your DMs say? I only need to see how you talk to other kids at school. Would I hear unchecked gossip? Do you slander? Do you explode in uncontrolled anger? Do you shade the truth to get a sale or to keep your job? Do you lie to your parents? Do you manipulate with your words so you can get your way? Do you use words to dominate and oppress people in your life? James is saying, if so, then I don't care what you say about your claim to be a Christian. You're not one. Your Christianity is worthless. James is saying in verse 26, if you claim to be a Christian, but you do not have control of your speech, I don't know what you mean by being a Christian. You think you're religious, but you deceive your heart your religion is worthless. You know, I was reading this text and it made me realize why I think the first sin that the Holy Spirit convicted me about when I was becoming a Christian, I was about 11 years old, was my mouth, the way I used words to either lie or give unhealthy speech. Second then, that's how to know your religion is worthless. How do you know your religion is real? Well, we could just flip that first point around, right? And say that controlling your speech is evidence that you've been born again. But in verse 27, James doesn't repeat that one. He gives two different signs of real Christianity. Care for the vulnerable and countercultural holiness. So let's read them. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. The first sign, care for the vulnerable, visiting orphans and widows in their affliction. These were the most vulnerable people in that first century culture. James here is not limiting our care to these two kinds of people. They are representatives 
of the broader category of caring for those who need our help. These were often the most vulnerable people mentioned in the Old Testament as well. God's law repeatedly called for the care for orphans and widows, and He often added care for the poor, the refugee, the disabled, right? the blind, the lame, the deaf. God's people are to care for those who are most prone to oppression in a society. James says to visit these kinds of people. Now, that doesn't mean just kind of schedule a time to hang out with them. Visiting uh, in this context meant actively, intentionally caring for them. So, let's just step back from this. In any culture, we have to step back and consider who are the most vulnerable and needy people in our culture? Who needs help in order to survive? Now, our culture does not have a consensus about these, who these kinds of people are right now. So, many are identifying certain groups as oppressed or as victims, and they're doing this based on gender or sexual preference or ethnic heritage. I'll put an article in the midweek on the topic of intersectionality if you want to know more about this and you don't know what that word is referring to. But one of the main problems is that this way of viewing the world is keeping us from seeing who the actual most vulnerable are, even if it pinpoints some vulnerabilities. It's keeping us from seeing who the most vulnerable are in our society. It's subtly shaping us to misunderstand what the most urgent needs are, which is what James is calling us to care about here. It's a lens, but it can distort what we're seeing in subtle ways that we don't even know is happening. So who are the orphan and widow category today? Who needs the most urgent care? Here's the vulnerable in our culture. Not exhaustive, uh, but some of the most vulnerable. Well, true orphans are. So some are in the foster care system, some are in orphanages around the world. Most of them are not in orphanages. They're on the street without parents struggling to survive, without support. Widows are still often vulnerable. Many single mothers are vulnerable. The most vulnerable and overlooked in our culture are the unborn. They're the most vulnerable and the least protected. Official health websites and agencies explicitly direct workers in the healthcare industry to not use language like abortion or termination of a pregnancy. They're to call it healthcare. Others call abortion reproductive justice, even though the very act is the greatest injustice to a child in the womb. It's intentional language manipulation. Those with disabilities are also vulnerable. The poor and the homeless. Refugees who escape a homeland and hardship. Abused women and children women and children who are trafficked. We don't talk about this much, but I think the increase of in vitro fertilization has created many orphans. They're real human beings, frozen as embryos, with no plan for what to do with them and bring them to development. And James says, here's a sign that your religion is real and not worthless. You care actively for these kinds of people. Andy Crouch put it this way, the real test of every community is how it cares for the most vulnerable. So most cultures fail at different points at this, of course, and many versions of Christianity fail at this. Second sign is countercultural holiness. James says the sign is to keep oneself unstained from the world. So what's the world? What is worldliness or being stained by the world? Well, it's the culture and values that are created when the self, capital S, is put at the center rather than God. David Wells put it this way, worldliness is that system of values in any given age which has at its center our fallen human perspective, which displaces God and His truth from the world, and which makes sin, this is really insightful, which makes sin look normal and righteousness seems strange. It thus gives great plausibility to what is morally wrong. So you see morally wrong things, but there's a sense of it's right. It seems plausibly right. And for that reason, it makes what's wrong seem normal. Worldliness, then, is when certain sins seem normal and holiness seems strange. And we can get shaped into worldliness. We can get stained by the world in subtle ways. It happens when We get used to watching certain movies and not skipping past certain scenes. It happens when you start laughing at jokes at the expense of the disabled. 
It happens when you start shading the truth because your coworkers are doing it as well. It happens when you incrementally embrace the culture's gender and sexual revolution. So those are the two signs. So we can summarize the message today like this. There is a kind of religion that pleases God, and there is a kind of religion that's worthless. If you claim to follow Jesus, then it should change how you speak and how you live. And if it doesn't, then your heart is deceived and your religion is worthless. And we've seen really in summary that there's three tests then of real Christianity. Controlled speech, care for the vulnerable, and countercultural holiness. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, if we truly embrace it, has implications for how we talk, and how we, who we care for, and how we live in the world. So I want to encourage those of you who are not yet Christians, and you know that, and you're exploring Christianity, maybe you're open to it, to consider this. As you examine what real Christianity is, remember that there is a difference between a worthless version that may call itself Christianity and a real version that is pure and undefiled before the one true God. The best way you can figure out this distinction is by reading the gospel accounts of Jesus in the Bible. So that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Pick one of those and read through it and get the real thing from Jesus. And if you know a Christian, ask them to read it with you. And as you have questions, they may not have all the answers. They probably don't. Um, But that's okay. You'll explore it together, and they can help you find answers that you have. If you don't know a Christian who can do that with you, uh, I'd love to connect you with someone. And as you read about Jesus, then ask two questions. Is this true, and is this good? Both questions matter, and real Christianity is not afraid of either of them. Now, you may not think at first that it's true or good. Uh, I believe that Jesus is the source of truth and goodness, and that's going to conflict with our categories and assumptions. But ask those questions of him. And I encourage you to join other atheists and secularists who are beginning to see that it is, in fact, both true and good. And now for Christians, here are four ways for us to respond to this text. So I have a reminder, a caution, a challenge, and an encouragement. So first, a reminder of the gospel. This this morning is not a message of mere moralism. Uh, This is not uh, some kind of works-based salvation with like, here's the path to earn your salvation or anything close to it. The takeaway from this morning is not merely, let's just try hard and do these things. This is about what life looks like when it actually is gripped by God, when it's transformed by His grace and the gospel. James gives these tests to discern if you actually have embraced God's grace by faith. So what happens if you fail this test? What happens if you've heard this message this morning and it's exposed your faith as empty? What do you do? Well, you don't first need to then try real hard to do these things. You need to be born again. You need God to give you a new heart. You need to trade worthless Christianity for real Christianity. And here's why I say this. Look back at verse 18. James said to these Christians he's writing to that they have been brought forth by the word of truth. That's a way of saying what Jesus taught, that we must be born again or brought forth as a new creation. And then it's from this starting point that James goes on to say, now don't just be a hearer but a doer, and now this morning, here's what doing looks like. So if you've experienced the new birth, then this is what starts to change. You start controlling your speech. You start caring for the vulnerable. You have a countercultural holiness. But this all flows from the grace of the new birth. And the new birth happens through embracing the word of truth, which is the gospel. So the gospel is the message that you and I are far more sinful than we even thought. And maybe that's even more exposed this morning. But Jesus came to give you love and to accept you by grace. So the message is that although the best we can do is create a worthless religion, Jesus came to give us the real thing, and it begins by trusting Him. He alone lived the the life with perfect controlled speech, 
caring for the vulnerable, us in our greatest need, eternal life and countercultural holiness. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose again as the king. And so pray. Ask him to forgive you and receive the new birth. And if you are a real Christian and you do see evidence of this in your life, you don't get to take credit and boast in the glory of it. God gets the credit because that is the fruit of the root of the new birth in your life, which he did. Yes, you work hard to do these things, and you must, but ultimately because God himself has changed you and is working in you. So that's the reminder. Second, a caution. One implication of this text is that we should be discerning about professions of faith in Jesus. Not everyone who claims to be a Christian has experienced the new birth. James is giving us a category for people who are self-deceived. So we should have a degree of caution when affirming someone's profession of faith. Now, this does not mean that we treat every profession with skepticism or judgmentalism. Let's not have a false dichotomy here. But it does mean we don't naively embrace them and give them false assurance. Instead, the word that we need for this is discernment. Yes, we're accepted by faith alone, but how can you know that someone actually is trusting? The evidence of the root of regeneration and the outgrowth of faith is seen in the fruit of a changed life. So, examine your own fruit. You may be a true Christian, and you need encouragement today. Maybe you always doubt your salvation, and maybe this message so far, because you have a sensitive conscience, isn't helping you with that. But you do have evidence of real transformation in your life. You have grown supernaturally, even if not as much as you'd like, with your speech. You, you have begun to care for vulnerable people in ways that you wouldn't if God didn't give you a new heart. You do have a countercultural holiness that's developed. That's a sign that you are real. We're not going to be perfect this side of Jesus' return, but we can be real. So be encouraged. Or you may be a true Christian, but you realize that your fruit is meager. You are like the tree in my front yard that we have a decision to make about. <laughs> it is a, it's been there for a long time, and one branch has leaves. I don't know why one. I don't even know how that works, but one branch, and that's less than last year. <laughs> it is sick. It is not in good shape. So if that's you, you need to not just hear God's Word, but do it. This also helps you understand other people in your life. You may have someone in your life whom you love and who claims to trust Christ, but they're not showing any evidence of this. There is zero fruit that you can see. It is not actually loving to let them live in their potential self-deception. The most loving thing you can do is express your concern and invite them to sincere faith before Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. Or you may have an adult son or daughter who's not following Jesus, but you remember when they were six that they prayed a prayer and they seemed to trust Jesus and you're clinging to that. Well, maybe it was sincere and that will be seen then if there's fruit. But if not, then there's little reason for confidence. You probably need to pray not so much for their growth in Christ, but for their true conversion. This is a reason we believe there's wisdom in waiting for baptism and communion for kids. We believe that God regenerates children. Many trust Christ at a young age, sincerely, and they bear fruit young. But it's also the case that children are still developing. They're generally open to trusting their parents and believing what their community around them teaches. And studies show that many kids, many who were baptized prematurely, end up walking away from their faith. Some churches have the majority of children who are baptized in their church when they grow up. They're, they're not walking with the Lord. And so it's wise to be discerning before we would give a public affirmation and assurance to them. So if you're a parent who wonders what to say when younger kids express faith or even have interest then in uh, baptism here, or Lord's Supper, here's what I say. I don't take a skeptical or discouraging tone. Again, that's not the point. No false dichotomies here. I assume it's true, 
to give charitable interpretations of people's professions of faith, while also encouraging growth and perseverance over time. So I say to my kids, I am so glad you are trusting in Jesus. And when you get older, we'll continue to talk about your faith and what it looks like to publicly express that in baptism and the Lord's Supper. So let's keep trusting Jesus together. So that's the caution. The third is a challenge. This text is a challenge for every Christian to lean into this kind of life. James is showing what we should prioritize as Christians. We should prioritize controlling our speech, care for the vulnerable, and countercultural holiness. We should prioritize this because that's this is what God calls us to do, and God is holy. So the Christian life is not supposed to be worthless. It's to actively do good. It's to be a light that shines. Christians should have a spreading goodness in our communities and culture. Finally, an encouragement. I want to take a moment to encourage us as a whole, as a church family, because when we're called to examine our fruit, some of us can be overly sensitive, or we can always be focused on what we're not doing. We have a kind of humility that leads us to not see how much God is doing in us. But actually, a proper humility would acknowledge what God has done. And he gets the credit, but to to see what he's done. And so I just want to pause and celebrate what God is doing in your lives. So we're not a church that is highly programmed, so we could miss this. We don't have a, a lot of official ministries that care for the vulnerable. Most of the work of our church is done not with Zionsville Fellowship attached to it, branded. It's through you all in everyday life, and that's intentional. Rather than over-programming it, we believe that our church can do more by empowering you to do this in your everyday life with the ways that God's gifted you in the relationships you have. But that means that we can sometimes miss how much is being done. So here's a few ways, and this is just a few of how some of you are actively, many of you are caring for the vulnerable. Several of you partner with Family Hope to care for children and to care for them for a few days or a few weeks or more who are in situations where they need to be removed from their home for a time. Some of you have become foster parents. Many of you have adopted orphans or children in need. And adoption is unique because Some acts of caring for the vulnerable happen, it's one decision and it lasts a moment or an hour or a few weeks. Adoption is the the one decision you make that is a commitment baked in to hundreds of thousands of decisions to care for the rest of your life. It's an ongoing care that, that actually no longer feels like caring for the vulnerable because it's natural love for family, but actually began with that decision to make hundreds of thousands of other decisions. Some of you work vocationally in social work to serve people in need. Two of you serve on the board of Love, Inc., which serves our county. Some of you embrace the calling to care for your child with a disability. You decided not to end their life in pregnancy, which has to be said in a culture like ours, but you committed to love and serve. Some of you embrace the calling to serve with Kairos uh, Prison Ministry, which also cares for wives and children while their husbands are incarcerated. A team of members has practically served and honored widows in our own church family over the years. Deacons and elders care for members in financial need through our in-reach process. Small groups rally around members in crisis to provide meals and help and support. Some of you high school students have befriended and stuck up for kids who are bullied. Many of you have served Neighborhood Fellowship Church, which often cares for orphans and widows and the poor in their community. One of you just sent me an email this week referencing all the kids at Vacation Bible School last year who heard the gospel and were fed breakfast and lunch and were loved by volunteers from Zionsville Fellowship. Some of you have volunteered in all sorts of ways to help local pregnancy centers. Some of you have stepped into public office to care for the vulnerable through policy change and politics and government service. Politics, done rightly, is an act of loving our neighbor and caring for the vulnerable. 
Some of you serve at Zionsville Meadows to care for the elderly, many of whom are neglected terribly by family members. Some of you love your literal neighbor in very practical ways as crisis comes into the life of the house next door or someone down the street loving, serving, blessing, lawn mowing, praying, befriending, checking in on, and so forth. So be encouraged. This is a sign that God has come to our church. He has filled your heart with the Holy Spirit, and your religion is not worthless. So let's end with this. The reason why these things matter is because this is what God is like. Did you notice James said, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. Not religion that's approved by the state or our society's consensus, but this is approved before God the Father. And this is pure and undefiled before him because this is what he's like. This is what he's done for us. He's cared for you and I in our greatest need while we were still weak, Romans 5 says. Vulnerable, needy, unable to save ourselves, Christ died for us. We're all wired to care ultimately for ourselves, but he's not like us. He cares for us in our need, giving forgiveness and eternal life and transformation. He's the father who adopts us into his family and cares for us in such a way that we then begin to reflect his character in the world. So real Christianity then is not just true, it's also good. And both of those matter because that's what Jesus is like and that's what the good news of the gospel is like. So Christianity, real Christianity, is good for the world. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that this is reality, that we don't have to make this up and make up a version of Christianity that's better than the real thing. We don't have to try to make up thoughts about you that are more appealing, but you are the source of all that is true, all that is good, all that is beautiful. So we pray that you would continue to give us eyes to perceive this, rearrange our values and our thoughts so that we embrace you and reflect you in the world. And we pray that there would be a surprising rebirth in trusting Jesus in our world that would change the world. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.